Welcome to the Economic Rockstar Podcast with your host, Frank Conway. Connecting brilliant minds in economics and finance. In this week's episode of the Economic Rockstar Podcast, I take a look back at some of the interviews of the past year. If this is the first time you've listened to this podcast, this will be a great opportunity to get a taste of what the Economic Rockstar Podcast is all about. If you've missed it, be sure to check out part one of the best of 2016. And why not check out the website economicrockstar.com forward slash podcasts to access all the interviews that have featured on the podcast. Never miss an episode of the Economic Rockstar podcast. Visit economicrockstar.com, submit your name and email, and you will get each episode straight to your inbox. First up, we have Stefan Szymanski from episode 90, who talks about soccernomics and how sabermetrics, inequality and finance rules the sport. What you were saying earlier on about your interest in financial analysis or the financial accounts of firms and then the clubs. And a simple correlation analysis, if you carry it out amongst, say, clubs and their profitability or, uh, say, for example, the amount of money that they have in, in terms of their expenditure and the value of their teams tends to correlate well with the outcomes in terms of where they position themselves in the league. And it's the same in the Euros. For example, I think Germany, all their players combined in the squad had the highest value. And I'm sure they're probably the favourites at the moment. Whereas someone like Ireland and Sweden and Wales, their value is relatively small. And that's, I suppose, comparable with any league where you have teams, say like the likes of Manchester United and Manchester City. And they have a, the bookmakers would actually put them as title winning favourites. So Leicester City, as we saw, blew that out of the water. Could a team like Wales, for example, win the Euros? Oh, well, yes. I mean, w- one thing about a, a knockout tournament is that even if things normally follow expectations, exceptional results are possible. Um, and if you think about it, I mean, if you look at the World Cup, it's almost always been the big countries that have won the World Cup, uh, certainly since since 1950. I mean, obviously, if you go back to earlier dates, there were a relatively small number of countries. But nowadays, it's the big countries that dominate. Um, whereas in the Euros, we've seen a few upsets. I mean, we did have, what, Greece in 2004 and Denmark in 1990 to um, winning the competition. So in, in that sense, um, they're, they're definitely the case that upsets are possible. I mean, they still remain relatively unlikely. It's still more likely than not that it's going to be one of the big um, perpetually dominant nations that will end up winning the competition. And, and as usual, it will almost certainly not be England. But, um, you know, there are there are still nonetheless, you know, um, some opportunities and, and some hope for the smaller teams. And after all, if there were no prospect at all of, of, of such upsets happening, then 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 we when we almost certainly wouldn't even watch it, would we? No, that's it. And I have a couple of questions. He's a colleague of mine, Richie Ling. I'd like to give him a shout out here. He's a big fan of your book. But he wants to know how applicable is sabermetrics type analysis to football? Because we've seen the story with Billy Bean in the Oakland A's and we're seeing a lot of teams now adopting this type of study in order to understand the, the behaviours of their own individual players on the soccer field and where best to apply them or apply their skills. I mean, that's a great question. And I think, I think it, you know, I think it really is a very interesting problem. And I think I, I, my feeling is that, and I, I'm still thinking and working on this myself, but I, I think there are basically two slightly different stories here about how data helps you. So one thing is that, that, that data can help you by you can develop ideas and then you can test those ideas by looking at the data. So so. Let me give you an example. So, for example, you could you could think about the idea that something I've been working on with a PhD student here uh, and an idea that came up, in fact, that came up in the numbers game, the book by Chris Anderson and David Sally about the weakest link. The idea that somehow it's not the quality of the best player in the team that matters. It's actually the quality of the worst player, because in other words, the the problem is that conceding goals is just as important as scoring goals. 
And the worst player on their team is likely to be the one that makes the mistake that leads to conceding the goal. So it might be that actually the it's that your worst player should be you. If you're thinking about investing in your team, you should invest in making the worst player better rather than worrying about making your star player any better. And that that's a really interesting hypothesis. And they put this forward in their book. And so the other my we got some data where we thought we could look at this. So we have the, we have some valuation data for each of the players in the Premier League going back over the last 20 years. Actually, data produced by a guy called Graham Riley, who, who did an enormous job in trying to identify all of the transfer fee values of, of the players over, over that period. And, um, we then looked at the we then were able to take that data and say well okay let's look at the impact of each player depending on their value in the team and depending on whether they're a, a, one of the highest value players or one of the lowest value players and through this analysis we were able to which i think covered something like i don't know 12 maybe 15,000 games something like that we were able to identify which players had the biggest impact based on their their market value and i mean interestingly we found no support for the for the idea that it was the weakest thing actually we found that if anything it was the not the not the very best player but the players ranked somewhere between second and fifth in the team by value these were the ones who seemed to be have most impact on determining the the outcome of the game so in that sense it, you know so there you have they have a good example of an idea which is interesting and which you can then test out with data and find out if it's true or not. And that might help you then make some decisions. But the problem with that is that you have to have the idea to begin with. So how do you know whether it's a which of the ideas that are worth thinking about and which of the ideas are, that, are, that are not worth thinking about? And the problem there is that this is like a needle in a haystack. So there could be far more important ideas that need to be tested but we just don't know what those ideas are. In fact, so it's it's not knowing what it is that we don't know it being the problem. And and ultimately that comes down to having a theory about how the game is played. In other words, having a theory about what is the most important thing in a football game. And and the problem here is it's a needle in a haystack. We have an endless range of possible possible events which we can look at or not possible but actual events in a game which we can look at and study and they're just so many of these events but the actual outcome of the game depends on uh, it, it comes down to just one or two moments in any game you know in, in a game where it ends up in a, a one nil victory for the home team then that that game is really determined by an event that takes about five seconds to happen. And it happens that that's the needle which is in the haystack, which is all the events in the 90 minutes that, that contribute to the outcome. And so that's where I'm sort of pessimistic as we are, you know, are not clear to me, at least. I, I can't see in my own mind's eye how we get to a resolution of that problem, how we decide what it is that we're looking for and how we might discover what it is that we're looking for. So I see the use of statistics in tracking down ideas and testing ideas, but it's the search for the good ideas, I think, is the problem. Rodney Fort, episode 99 on sport economics, big data and baseball and the value of hosting an Olympic Games. Rodney, I'm guessing, correct me if I'm wrong, baseball is your game. I love baseball. Right. So, if, if 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 sports economics couldn't inform me about baseball, I wouldn't do it. Yeah, I, I've been to a few baseball games myself, and seen the Red Sox and the Yankees play. Mm -hmm. and so I had uh, the opportunity to get to Fenway Park, and it's a fantastic game. Uh, little did I understand much about baseball, but I quickly got into the swing of things. Really, baseball is probably the holy grail to for the economists when it comes to data and no better um, movie to explain this is moneyball whereby we got a huge insight in how statisticians could have could use all of this data to for the oakland days to go on a record run of games and now we have Managers, say for example in the English Premier League, adopting this type of strategy and hiring economists or statisticians to work. And we've seen it with Chelsea in the Champions League, 
they hired a, an economist to analyse penalty taking kicks against uh, Manchester United and almost pulled it off. Mm-hmm. The the whole money ball thing is fascinating. Okay, for a guy like me, if you study sports for a while, I suppose if you study any right industry for a while, you become a bit of a historian for that industry as well, right? And I have read more than once from trusted biographers, right, that the first person to think statistically about baseball was the person who invented the batting average, and that was in 1870, <laughs> right? I mean, so it, there's always been a focus on a statistical take on sports. Branch Rickey did hire an accountant statistician and did invent a variety of metrics to measure player um, uh, player performance over and above batting average and ERA, for example. So this is nothing new under the sun. Here's what's new, though, right? What's new is the so-called big data phenomenon, and, and you saw it to a T in the Moneyball episode, okay? What's new is the big data phenomenon, where we've got lots of data. Well, in sports, we always had lots of data. i got an anecdote for you if you want to hear it sometime about you know my first involvement with big data. Definitely. But the... But the so we, we've got immense amounts of data, and we now have the computing power to turn it into useful decision data. And that is exactly right what Billy Bean and, and his office did. And remember, what they did wasn't to, you know a, a, a really a revolutionary thing. They didn't change the business model in baseball. What they did was use big data with very smart analytics to bring metrics home for decision-making purposes and discovered a hole in the labor market. That's what they did. Okay? I like the way you put that, and, discovered a hole in the labor market. Exactly. And so they, they, they discovered the hole and they said, hmm. They went to ownership and said, you know, for the same amount of money that you're spending, I can win you a few more games, which is exactly the right uh, thing to bring to owners. People who are studying analytics should never go to a sports team owner or, or manager and say, I can tell you how to win more games. They know how to win games. That's not the issue. right? Winning, everybody knows how to win. You know how to win. I know how to win. My students know how to win. The question is, can you get the level of winning that's best in, you know, for you in your market in an economically effective way? And that's exactly what Billy Bean did. He went to ownership and he said, you're spending, you know, I know how much you want to win. And you're spending ineffectively to get to that level of winning. Here's how you can fix it. And that's what, you know, he, uh, he and his, his office discovered. Now, that is the epitome of sports analytics. That's what it can do and some of the coolest things it can do. The next thing to remember, though, of course, is that in retrospect, analysts have now looked at the Billy Bean miracle and decided and, and pretty much decided, I think, that it lasted for about two years. He had that advantage for about two years. And then the rest of the market looked at him and said, yeah, he's really on to something. And they closed that, that hole as fast as they could. He could no longer exploit it. Okay. The, it, it, and, and here's the, you know, the other part of it, right? People always want to juxtapose smart management against money. So you mentioned you saw a Yankees Boston game, right? So there are two of the biggest spending teams in history. And historically, they are always at the top of spending. People want to look at that and say, oh, well, see, their markets are such that they don't really have to be very good at what they do. They just collect all the money and buy all the good players. And they and for, and for some reason, you know, they, they tag for certain franchises that way. And then they look at smaller market teams, right, smaller revenue you know, market teams and go, they must have to be really, really smart to be able to compete with these big, fat teams that can buy whatever they want to buy, okay? What's, what cracks me up about that is, Everybody is trying to do the best they can in terms of economizing on wins because you get to keep the rest in pro sports. And if profit is a motive, profit is a motive. And there's no reason for the Yankees or, or the Red Sox to be any stupider about profit than the, uh, than the uh, Oakland Athletics. So everybody's trying to do exactly what Billy Bean did. Okay, It's just that the result is that in New York you've got to spend a lot more money to make your fans happy than you do in Oakland. So, so I, I, I really do encourage people when they're thinking about analytics to remember that. Everybody does analytics. Everybody always has done analytics. And the idea that you can beat the market with analytics 
has to rely on anecdote and observation and uh, non-equilibrium results like we saw with Billy Bean. He found a hole in the labor market. Now, if you remember the, the Oakland A's of that time, though, also remember this. They won more games than most people thought they should have won for their payroll. And they, right, occasionally made the playoffs in those early years of Moneyball. But they didn't get any farther than that. And here's what Billy Bean said, and I wish I had saved the quote. I keep looking for it. Billy Bean said, yeah, we, we you know, really took advantage of, of, a, of a wonderful thing we found about the labor market, and if I'd had another $50 million in payroll, we'd have made the World Series. <laughs> <laughs> so it, so it's, 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 it's never a juxtaposition of smart guys can always beat rich guys, mm. right? Because everybody's smart. The juxtaposition is, is really there are larger revenue market teams. And typically, and on average, as we've seen historically, they win more games than smaller revenue market teams. And that's the issue in pro sports. It is precisely the issue. But everybody wants to use analytics, right, to uh, to, to get there, to, to make as much money as they can. And what's very cool, right, is not so much that, oh, some teams are smarter than others and some are spending more than us. Nobody has an I- any idea about what's really going on there. We get occasional filtered anecdotes through the press that, oh, these guys are hostile to analytics. I, I'll, I'll bet you $10,000 that that's not true, right? It, they may be going about it a different way than some particular analytic, you know, sports analytics person thinks they should, but that's a sports analytics person's problem. These guys have been at this game for, you know, 200 years. They've been at this game, uh, you know, as, as a sole passion, as a 24-7, 365 activity. It, it, it strains credibility to believe that they would let anything under the sun go uh, un, uh, un, uninvestigated because they, well, we just don't do it that way. <laughs> 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 but here's what is cool, right? What is cool is, the re- I think the reason that we see so many uh, teams actually having their own sports analytics uh, uh, branch, you know, inside the organization, is because of uh, big data is because there are now tons of data, and there always were, but the computing power and the ability of smart people, smart analysts, to be able to turn it into decision data is what's really going on. That's why it's happening. Stephen Kensler in episode 83 talks about stock flow models, rent controls, and being the green lantern of economics. So the problem was, how do you teach master's level monetary economics, which is a very technical subject, to people with quite with very little uh, economics uh, uh, background. They quite a lot of finance, but very little economics. So I, I went casting around and I asked my PhD advisor, uh, my first PhD adv- advisor, for a reasonable textbook. And he suggested a book by a uh, book which was then just out, uh, which was actually in, in galley form. It wasn't even published at that point uh, by these two dudes, uh, Win Godley and Mark Lavoie, called Monetary Economics an Integrated Approach. So <clears throat> his point was look, you can give them a balance sheet, you can you know, show them the Irish economy. You can show them one of the one or two of these little models, and you'll be grand. Um, and I actually had a, a, one of the sort of again one of the formative formative things really for me was uh, getting to talk to Win Godley on the phone. Um, he was quite elderly at this stage, um, but still an extremely nice man. And he said he said that he, he would use me as a teaching case study um, uh, for the book. You know, so we agreed to talk throughout the semester every week or so, um, or every second week. T- to let him know for, so that I could let him know how I was getting on teaching the book. So he more or less tutored me over the phone in stock flow consistent macro, which was, which was awesome. So here's what it is. The idea is that you have a balance sheet, right? And a, a, a and, and a flow of funds. So if, if I buy a Mars bar off you, I exchange money for this product, right? But what also happens is your bank account is credited and my bank account is debited, right? So there's a flow, there's a, there's a stock, if you like, of money in each of our bank accounts. Let's say you've got a tenner and I've got 20. And afterwards, there's a flow. So let's say the, let's say the Amaris bar is a euro or something. Um, so mine goes down to 19 and yours goes up to 11, right? So there's a stock, which, which obviously is changing over time. It's the buffer. And then there's the flow. And you can think about it, you can think about it as well in terms of a bathtub. Um, if you've got a bathtub and it's empty, there's no stock and no flow. If you put, if you if you um, if you turn on the tap, but the sink is is is, is missing, well then you've all flow and no stock, right? Because the the the, money, the 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 water's just flowing down. 
If you then plug the thing up, what happens is the flow of water coming from the tap begins to build up in the, in the tub, and that's the stock of available money now what, or available water. Now, what's interesting about this is that, is that uh, economists have always been aware of flows. Um, they're typically very bad at understanding stocks. And so most of the models that have been written are actually written in what, what we call flow space. Like so, for if you think about GDP for a second, gross domestic product, this is the sum of all uh, of the flows within the system: the flow of consumption, flow of investment, flow of government expenditure, and the flow of net exports. Right? Oh, in a given year or a given quarter or whatever, the stock, if you like, of that, the stock of GDP, is uh, or the stock of, if you like, accumulated wealth, is actually very difficult to measure. And uh, you know, we we find it hard to measure these things. Um, and so what, what, what stock flow models do in a, in a very kind of methodologically interesting way is try to connect these things and try to connect the stock to the flow to understand how these economies are very dynamic. And so it's, it's from it's teach, trying to teach international monetary economics that I, I come to this. And uh, it, what was really interesting was the Irish economy had a real stock flow problem. The stock of debt was 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 very low in 2006, and now it's massive and it's falling uh, because what we're doing is we're repaying a, a, a fair, uh, we were repaying some of it, but also we tend to think in terms of uh, uh, um, flow stock or stock flow ratios. So if you think about debt to GDP, for example, um, so this is the stock of debt divided by the flow of GDP, right? Um, and if you think about I don't know unemployment, right? So you've got the stock of the unemployed divided by the stock of the labor force. So you've got the stock-stock uh, 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 relationship and so forth. Um, you, the, the, you, once you start thinking in this way, you kind of see them everywhere, you know, and you realize that a lot of what we tend to recognize as stability or stability-enhancing um, stability objects in the system are really what, what godly and Lavoie call stock flow norms. That is, these are things that just tend to, they tend to be in a certain way, you know. So uh, debt to GDP, when it gets above about 120, 130%, you know, I, I, I don't think 90% is a threshold in the way that Reinhardt and Rogoff, Reinhardt and Rogoff say it is, but actually it is a, it is a problem. If you get above 120%, things are going wrong. Similarly, if your own employment rate is above 10%, things are probably going wrong for you and so forth. Um, it's a way of, quite naturally and quite atheoretically describing an economy. So there's no, you know, post-Keynesian or neoclassical or whatever here. It's just staring at the economy and at, at its accounts going, what's wrong? Are things going up? Are things going down? Are things where they should be? And so forth. And uh, it, it, I found it an extremely useful way to analyze the health of the Irish economy and the European one as well. And so, and I've also been spending a lot of my time trying to advance the, the, that subject theoretically. And when you were saying um, 120% debt-to-GDP ratio is, could be seen as a problem, is that because the flow may not be there given the high level of stock, or have I got that right? That's precisely right. So, so if you think about a debt-to-GDP ratio, you, the, the, the cardinal thing about debt is that it doesn't really matter. Your debt stock doesn't really matter as long as somebody's willing to give you more of it so you can refinance, you know? But what, what, what is always true is that the flow of taxable income, so the amount of cash that you actually get into the banks, to the government's coffers in a given year, has to be has to be enough such that it can service the interest costs of, the, of any debt, right? So those flow flow measures matter uh, deep within the system, and if you don't have those things right, you're going to be in trouble, you know, uh, really deep trouble actually. So it's that kind of stuff that you know um, when we think about it, it's that kind of stuff that when we think about it, we go, oh god, we need it. We really need to fix this. We really need to think carefully about about. Um, about uh, these issues. And, uh, you know, um, that's really where I've spent a fair bit of my time. Julia Norgard, episode 109 on the online black market for drugs and why detection rates are low. You wrote a paper on reputation in the internet black market, an empirical and theoretical analysis of the deep web. I'm so, I suppose, in awe on how you actually approach this in terms of trying to extract data firstly from a website or a, the deep web where a lot of the data is very hard to extract, I'm sure. Yes, it was. This has been an absolutely fun and exciting project. And I actually got involved with this project in 2013 when I started graduate school at George Mason 
And Ross Ulbricht, who was eventually, or excuse me, was just arrested for operating the dark net market known as the Silk Road. And it was all over the news. And I read very extensively about it. And I just found this topic extremely interesting, especially from an economic lens. And this launched my interest for what now makes up my dissertation. And if um, you will allow me, I'm just going to back up a little bit and explain a few components of the internet black market. And then I'll go into the specifics of my research with it. So the internet black market is able to exist because of two, the advent of Bitcoin and Tor. So Bitcoin is a semi-anonymous cryptocurrency that uses blockchain technology, and it functions in a distributed network that is very decentralized. This is basically allows you to exchange what's sort of like a cash over the internet. And um, this was championed in 2008, so fairly new. And this, coupled with Tor, which stands for The Onion Router, um, which was initially released in 2002 by the U.S. Naval Research Laboratory that was initially utilized to protect U.S. intelligence communication online and was eventually opened up to the greater public. It's a software that allows anonymous communication over the Internet, and it's called The Onion Router because it encrypts data in layers that make it very, very difficult to track. So when data is traveling from one eye, um, one area of the internet to another, it um, it's encrypted, and even the destination IP address um, is is not available at at times. So as this data travels, it travels through a network of users um, that is made up of thousands of relays. And when the data is randomly bounced through these relays and gets to a relay, um, each relay um, unencrypts a little bit of it and allows it to go to the next relay. And this searching over the internet <clears throat> basically allows people to be anonymous over the internet. And the coupling of that with Bitcoins has allowed the internet black market to basically come about. And this is a phenomenon that's extremely new. And from an economic perspective, it's a particularly interesting because if you look at basically just classic um, internet exchange forums like Amazon, for example, if something goes wrong, you can take legal recourse ex post. If Amazon sells me something and I never receive it, typically um, because of the seller's reputation, they'll want to sell it again or excuse me, ship it to me again, but not always. And with typical ground black markets, you often see people taking physical recourse ex post and um, in gangs, for example. And with the internet black market, it's kind of a combination of both these two type of, types of exchange that have been studied extensively. However, it allows us, as you were saying, um, to get data on this, which I'll, I'll touch on in just a minute. Um, but this is just a fascinating marketplace because it has no way to take legal or physical recourse ex post. So all the decision making and reputation building needs to be done ex ante. And this is what I particularly look at. Um, so a little bit more info on the internet black market. So there's three main components of it. The surface web, or excuse me, um, the surface web is what we search on every day. It's indexed and accessible data. And just if you were to Google information, Again, that is both indexed and accessible to the public. There's the deep web, which is estimated to be thousands of times larger than the surface web. And this is data that's accessible, but not indexed. So for example, Frank, if you were to buy something on Amazon, you type in your credit card information. I can't Google Frank Conroy Conway's credit card information um, because that exists in the deep web. However, the dark net is a small part of the deep web that is not accessible um, through standard web browsers, you need Tor to access it typically. And that is data that's both restricted and non-indexed. So this is a very particular uh, portion of the deep web that's, again, fairly new. Tying all those together about the anonymity and the non-indexation of the information. When you have that combined, you obviously do not have what Amazon has and also what a physical transaction might incur even if there's criminals on the other side they could physically uh, harm you if you end up not making payment or they deliver you the wrong material so the problem here re regarding the darknet is that once people remain anonymous they 
do not have the ex post reputation that you could end up relying on. So all of this has to be done up beforehand or the relationship, not the even the relationship, but the buying and selling and the exchange has to happen with some degree of trust. That's a, a really great point. And that's something that I really focus on in my research. And I use a lot of the literature of Bernstein, Grief, Benson, and particularly Leeson to really frame what I'm looking at and basically say, exactly, if people are anonymous, they can't take any recourse ex post, how does this exchange take place? And so we look at, my colleague August Hardy and I look at the reputation mechanisms and how that plays a role in, in the marketplace and whether or not people with a strong reputation are able to charge a premium for their particular goods. And so I just want to clarify a little bit. So each user on the internet black market is not anonymous per se. They do have a a username that's connected with reputation. However, their own personal identity is anonymous. And so you can't, I mean, you can take recourse in the sense that you can, if you bought something that you decided that you didn't like or was bad, you can seek recourse in the sense that you can give the seller a bad rating, but you can't seek any recourse with them physically or to their own person. So that kind of makes it extra complicated. And what's surprising is because of this internet black market, you'd think that it'd be very different and there'd be a lot of different mechanisms that are very unique uh, relative to Amazon. But surprisingly, there's a lot of very similar components. There's different rating systems. People leave reviews. There's um, a star system that we use in order to do. So a five-star rating is the top rating that you can get as a seller on the internet black market. And users are extremely diligent in their efforts to provide each other in this particular community with reliable information about a seller because, frankly, um, because of the particular nature of these goods, they are illegal substances, often times very, very lethal, very dangerous. And the community has taken it upon itself to basically call people out if they are selling fraudulent goods and if they're not being honest in the marketplace. Darshak Patel, episode 71 on using popular culture to engage economic students in a classroom and online. In another paper that you wrote, and it's quite interesting, and I, I think it does tie in with ESPN 30 for 30, and I'd like to talk a little bit more about that if you don't mind, Darshak. But you wrote about a video scrapbooking, an art form revived in the economics curriculum. So um, you're looking at using, I suppose, these videos and creating a scrapbook of ideas and principle and economics to integrate it into the curriculum and what these espn now when i when i hear espn i think of sports now i'm not sure <laughs> if that's correct yeah. or is that a network a tv network it is it is a sports tv network okay so the 30 for 30 are so top 30 yeah, so the, documentaries. Yeah, the thirty doc. So initially, they were trying to they created ESPN thirty for thirty to celebrate thirty years of uh, ESPN, and to celebrate the thirty years of ESPN, ESPN, uh, they wanted to uh, create a documentary where they they found thirty directors and producers, and they told them to make a video of anything they found something that relates to them, whether it's sporting or whether it's about a certain decade or a certain year or a certain player. A uh, certain individual and related to a sporting event. So, what ha- ended up happening was this: most ESPN of the most ESPN documentaries t- ended up being uh, dealing with history or social events or uh, socioeconomic issues, and not really to sports, but it connected to some sporting event. So, for example, uh, two Escobars was one which I really like to use in uh, my classrooms, and. Um, that was more about economics than sports. So the whole idea of two Escobars was it kind of connected the two Escobars. One was a soccer player, which I like to say football, but in America they tend to use soccer. And they tried to use the soccer player Escobar to Pablo Escobar, uh, the drug dealer. And they kind of connected the drug uh, business in Colombia to soccer because they used to use soccer clubs to uh, funnel their cocaine money. And so the whole documentary was all about the main Escobar who got into the drug business and why he got into the drug business and what kind of economic uh, incentives led him to drug business. And uh, it's his, his issue and his organization issue with the government and so on. So when people hear ESPN 
30 for 30, they always think it's sports, but it was our job to kind of sell the idea that no, it's not only to do with sports. It is more than sports and it highlights social and cultural problems rather than sports. And that's why we wrote this paper, hoping that people read the paper and see that there's a great benefit and advantage of using these ESPN 30 for 30 rather than it just assuming that it's just for sports and only attracts a narrow audience. Uh, we believe that individuals who eventually ended up using it found that it attracts a wider audience and not just a male-dominated audience would be interested in sports. I suppose it is a fantastic window into observing what happened in the past, especially like you might see the time with Ronald Reagan, for example, in office with the, the lockout. I, I, I don't know if it was referred to as the lockout when there was mass union strikes at the time and his dealings with, with that. Uh, I, I don't know if that was covered in ESPN 30 for 30, but in Ireland we have a similar program called Reeling in Years. And again, it looks at events on a yearly basis and what's happened during those events. And you just probably gave me an idea to try and do something like that in terms of those events in Ireland or with our international neighbours and see what if there's any economics, and I'm sure there is, that we could relate to some parts of principles of economics. I think that's a brilliant idea, yeah. and I think you should try and give that a shot and research more into that, because I think what history does is it also makes this emotional connection with students, and because you can tell a story and then use that story to show a connection with economic concepts. And I think those stories that you find, which are true stories and history, uh, would really make a, a significant positive impact within a uh, learning economics uh, in Ireland and hopefully the neighbouring countries up there as well. Your dissertation, your PhD dissertation, Tarshak, where you explored the use of option value theory to explain student decision-making in post-secondary school. You don't mind talking about that for a moment if I ask you a couple of questions? Sure, yeah, go ahead. Firstly, what is option value theory? Okay, so the idea I used option value theory was uh, I even I see initially used it and then I kind of moved a step away from it. But it was kind of to counter uh, the traditional view that individuals make decisions of the future. For example, if you just finish high school, you make a decision of finishing college at that point. So you weigh your benefits versus costs and decide that uh, you want to carry on to college or you want to move away from college and go to the labor force. However, the idea of using option value theory was that these decisions aren't really made uh, at discrete time periods. They're in fact, made at every time an individual gets new information. So, for example, a student joins college. Uh, once joins college, finishes the first semester, then they can reevaluate whether co continuing college was a, a valid option for them or should they move away to the labor force. So it's just moving away from the traditional theory saying that, okay, we make decisions for four years in advance right now, rather than you're making decisions and step-by-step -step process. And so I related that into the schooling system where students who are graduating from high school, first of all, they decide whether they want to go to a, a post-secondary institution as opposed to labor force. And once they do enter post-secondary institution, we were determining factors uh, affecting their retention the graduation or the transfer from two-year colleges to four-year colleges. And have you concluded what the main factors that determine this decision? So we followed students who went to two-year colleges in, a uni at, in the state of Kentucky, and they're all under one umbrella. Uh, it's called the K Kentucky Community uh, Technical College System. So it's all under one umbrella. So we followed uh, several uh, thousand students uh, who came out from two different cohorts. And... Um, our biggest uh, control was for controlling for earnings. And then we also control for financial aid. And we also control for the educational uh, abilities. And those are the biggest factors of having a job or not or uh, having earnings. So if your earnings increased, uh, we saw the retention levels actually decrease. So the opportunity cost of going to college were quite high. And we also found that um, the lack of uh, financial aid also negatively impacted retention levels and ability was also uh, positively related to retention. So the more, the more better uh, you did in classes, the better ACT scores you had, the better uh, chances were for you to continue uh, staying in school or graduating as well. Episode 111 with Greg Mankiw on writing, carbon tax, healthcare and education. <laughs> what was the reason for setting up this Pico, Pico Club? And I know some of the members you have included, uh, Neil Young and Bill Gates. And yeah. 
Um, well, you know, I remember when I was a student thinking, reading about the idea of corrective taxes, the taxes can be used to correct externalities and mark, make markets work better. It was a tremendously powerful idea. Um, and I've, I've really, I've thought that really since I took my principles course. And my, when I teach principles, I teach that as a really a tremendously powerful idea in economics. When I turned to sort of thinking about public policy and sort of writing op-eds or advising policymakers, I, I, I think, think of this as really an important idea that's underappreciated by the public at large. I think I, first, I wrote my first sort of op-ed on the virtues of higher gasoline taxes about 20 years ago when I was writing, well, at that time I was a columnist for Fortune magazine. And I've had, and I, over the years of probably every, I don't know, year or two, I'll write another column about the virtues of corrective taxes. And I created this fictional club called the Pigou Club, which is really a rhetorical device explaining how there's lots of economists and pundits on different sides of the political spectrum who basically favor this idea of higher corrective taxes. It's not a popular idea with the general public, but I think I, the more we preach to the general public that this is a good idea, the more likely it is that we'll actually get something like that. Because I'm a big believer in that all politicians will ultimately do what the public wants. And so as long as we correct the, convince the public that a corrective tax is a good idea, then we'll, we'll get in policy. So for example, in Washington State right now, if anybody here from Washington State, pay attention. Because on the, on the, on your ballot in November is a revenue neutral carbon tax. Uh, at the state level. Basically, they're going to basically raise the carbon tax, or impose a carbon tax, and lower the state sales tax. And some other tax reductions too, but the most of the revenue is used to reduce the state sales tax, which is really sort of a, a great policy. Even those, even if those who aren't in Washington State, uh, October 30th, turn on to the National Geographic Channel, I think it's 8 or 9 o'clock, good, good check. There's a new movie out called uh, Before the Flood, which is a movie about climate change produced and, and narrated by Leonardo DiCaprio. It talks about the, the challenges of climate change. And I actually have a small bit part in there. I mean, I'm all on the screen for maybe all of 45 seconds. Preaching the virtues of a carbon tax. Actually, right after Elon Musk talks about why he needs a carbon tax in order to make his, you know, his clean vehicles more cost effective. I sort of talk about the, the broader virtues of a carbon tax. So, so look for, look for that movie, uh, before the flood. Uh, that, that being, being, being part of that movie actually gave me my coolest 15 minutes of my life. Well, I got to, at the Toronto Film Festival have drinks with Leonardo DiCaprio, which is not something the most academics get to do in a course of life. So I'm sure I'll never reach that level of coolness again in the rest of my life. Except me being here with Frank. <laughs> um, yeah, I spoke to Joran Bauman as well um, recently in a podcast episode, and he spoke highly of you with his te your 10 principles of economics. And he is also a very passionate supporter of the carbon tax and I, I'm sure you have that relationship too. He's part of the Pigo Club. Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah. yeah. Yoram Bauman, who some of you may have seen as being the, the stand-up comedian who did the, the, the take up, yeah. the take the stand-up of my uh, ten principles uh, of economics, is a passionate environmental economist, and he is actually the intellectual force behind the the ballot initiative in Washington State. So he's been a big proponent of that, and um, I've I've been able to help him a little bit, but I think that he's clearly been a very big force in Washington State. And this could be a huge victory for the carbon tax movement. Yeah. I'd love to ask you also about health and healthcare. Again, something you're very in yeah. much interested in. I'm not American, so but I do know what's going on in terms of Obamacare and the difference, differences in the opinions of the Democrats and the Republicans in terms of that type of healthcare. You claim to, or you suggested in one of your posts that you were more of a libertarian than a communitarian. Yes. And when it comes to uh, healthcare, or was that inequality? Well, I, I, I've, I've often, I've sometimes described myself as a libertarian at the margin. And by that I mean, I mean, when I see the libertarian party, they seem a little too extreme for me. But given where we're starting today, I think a little bit more reliance on free markets, individual responsibility, and personal liberty would be a good thing. Yeah. So I think sort of given where we are, sort of a small movement in the direction of the libertarian party would be a good thing. Although the, the huge leap that some of, some of the hardcore libertarians want is a little too big, too big for me. So the, the healthcare issues, would you be in support of the, I suppose, Obamacare, or would you like an alternative in terms of what's being discussed at the moment to? Well, well, you know, it's funny. It's interesting that the Republican alternatives to Obamacare were, were in some ways very different, but in some ways kind of similar to Obamacare. John McCain, when he was running against Obama, was talking about policies like a refundable tax credit for, for, for buying health care in the private market. 
Well, fundable tax credit is not that different from a subsidy. <laughs> and so if you actually look at the de details, they, were, they weren't as far apart as, you, as one, one might think. I think there was some differences to how, how heavy-handed the regulation of the healthcare market would be, um, how much money would be spent, and so on. So I think, there's, I think there, were, there, there were differences, but the overall approach wasn't that different. Um, in terms of Obamacare, and specific, specifically, I think Obamacare had two stated objectives and had two real objectives, and I think those over, one of those two objectives overlapped. The two stated objectives were to um, increase coverage, health care coverage, health insurance coverage, and also to lower the cost of health care. I, I think it has done a, something to increase health insurance coverage, although not as much as they had hoped. I don't think it's done very much at all to lower insurance costs. Uh, in fact, there's been quite bad news lately about that for, I think, good adverse selection kind of reasons that economists understand. But I think there's another objective of Obamacare that was never really stated, which was it was partly his desire to spread the wealth around. I mean, President Obama is clearly in favor of more income redistribution than we had previously. And part of that, part of the whole structure of taxes and subsidies of Obamacare was to have more income redistribution. Uh, of more redistribution of resources, which I think was probably pretty clear in their own mind is what was what their objective is, but it was not, never a stated objective because I think that was not a politically popular one. I don't really, I think reducing health care costs was, was politically more popular. I think it's actually very, very hard to do. I mean, I'm a believer that one of the reasons we have increasing health care costs over time is because we probably should have increasing health care costs over time. As we get richer as a society, it makes sense to spend higher and higher fraction of income on, on health care. Or to put, to put it most bluntly, think of sort of diminishing margin utility. As we get richer, we have more stuff. But some stuff runs into diminishing margin utility faster than others, right? As we get richer, we maybe, instead of having two bathrooms in our house, we have three bathrooms in our house. But at some point, you kind of run into diminishing margin utility in bathrooms. I mean, having, going from three to eight really doesn't increase happiness very much. How many bathrooms do you really need? On the other hand, years of life, you know, to live longer doesn't seem to run into diminishing margin utility. People, I, I can imagine somebody saying, I don't want another bathroom, but very rarely do people say, I don't really want any years of life. Thank you very much, but 80 is fine. Uh, people, so, I, so given that we don't really run into diminishing margin utility in life expectancy, sp as we get richer, spending a higher, higher fraction of our income on health, health care, kind of makes sense. Um, and so that doesn't mean our system is perfect, but, this, but, but the, the fact that, that we're spending a higher and higher fraction on health care is probably a good thing. Uh, and not something that we should necessarily be fighting. And would you have that same type of outlook in terms of pricing for goods in general and services? Because again, I realized or I read that you paid $2,500 for a ticket for Hamilton and <laughs> Matt Russo here in the audience, he paid $89 for the same ticket. <laughs> um, I, I, I tend to be favor market markets for allocating Allocating resources, so I'm not against ticket resales. Um, you know, I've been, my, my wife has been wanting to see Hamilton for, for really since it came out. Um, and I've been looking at the prices, and I could think it's really so expensive. They've eventually got to come down, yeah. and they haven't been coming down. And uh, so we were having to be in New York, taking my my son on some college tours, and uh, and so I said, look, we're already in New York. I don't, I don't have to pay. I, we, I don't have to pay for a hotel. We're already here. It's not, it's not incremental cost. Let me go buy some Hamilton tickets, and they were extremely. Expensive. I've never paid that much for, for tickets before, um, but um, but it was worth it. In a sense, it was a, it was a fantastic experience. I'm a big believer in actually paying for experiences rather than things. So things just sort of accumulate dust. Experiences accumulate memories, and they, and and they think the, the memories are, are great. And Hamilton's just actually a great show. So I actually I did pay a lot, but I think it was worth every penny. Episode one one six with Brian O'Rourke on the economics of superheroes and the Hunger Games. I passed by that presentation. You had the door opened in Florida and I, I didn't go in and I had to walk backwards again because I saw on the screen Deadpool. Oh, yeah. And I thought, hang on there now. What's this about? I want to go in, but I just couldn't interrupt toward, I think it was toward the end. So I missed out on it, but I have your slides and I just wanted to know and I wanted to ask you why was Deadpool on the screen that time. And I can see all your other slides, Superman. And if you don't mind, I could uh, create a link on my own website to link to these slides for anybody who was interested in them. That'd be terrific. Yeah, so Deadpool's, you know, Deadpool's one of these superheroes where if there wasn't a movie about Deadpool, very few people would know anything about him. And there's a lot of superheroes like that. 
But what's kind of fun as you explore these different superheroes and the powers that they have and, and how they get their powers, that, that's one of the neat angles on, and looking at the economics of superheroes and sort of th- just looking at their backstories. Where do they come from? And uh, the character Wade Wilson is, is approached. He's got he's just been told he's got terminal cancer. So there, he's told that there's a way that he can be cured of this cancer. And what am I going to do? So he has to go through this thought process of, you know, is it worth it? They've told me, you know, I've got to go away to this center. And, and he decides, you know what, it's whatever the pain involved is, whatever the physical pain is, let's, let's go through with this. So he's weighing his costs and benefits. And, and so that's part of it. But the best scene in the movie to me is this marginal analysis that he does right in the middle of a fight scene. So he's been sort of interacting with some of the X-Men and they're trying to get him to join the X-Men. And so he's in the middle of this fight scene and he starts to think about this conversation that he had with one of the X-Men. And, and he starts to enumerate the pros and cons of being a superhero. It's just, it's unbelievable. You know, so I've got to, I, I go into class and I'm, I'm trying to teach about marginal thinking. And, you know, these, these little things that, you know, should I do a little bit more of something? Should I do a little less of something? And so we're thinking at the margin. And oftentimes when you're thinking at the margin, you want to kind of take a look at the pros and cons. And most of the students have done that, at least in their minds. They may not have sat down and written them out. But I can show this. I've got to be careful how much of it I show because in, in the movie, the language is a little harsh. But you can just go through and show how people think at the margin or they, they make these decisions based on the pros and cons. And, and here's Deadpool doing it while he's in the middle of this fight about, well, you know, if I, you know, joining the superheroes makes me look like a geek because, you know, they got to be all good and all the time. And, but, you know, you get all the girls if you're the superhero. And so it's really a, a neat 30 second clip out of that movie of just thinking about the, the benefits and the cost of making this particular decision. Brian, I'd love to know when you were talking about looking at the Flash and other programs and sitting down to extract some economic themes from them. Do you sit there with a pen and paper and jot down whatever it might be? Do you have a list that you now have created and try to identify some of these types of themes or concepts within the uh, the movies or programs? Or how do you go about doing it? Usually what I do is I have something I'm going to teach on that day or that week. And I try to relate it to some sort of scene in a superhero, either TV show or a movie. Um, sometimes, though, when I'm watching the shows, those themes just kind of pop up. And yeah, then I'm sitting there uh, looking for a pen and a paper to, to write that down so I don't forget it. Um, I've been really fortunate to have kept in touch with some folks that I went to high school with who are huge comic book and superhero fanatics. And so that's, I can, you know, if I have an idea, uh, and, and a topic that relates to it, I can go to them and say, hey, guys, this is what I'm looking for. Do you, can you think of anything? And that's been really, really valuable for me uh, just to have the, the people who are so familiar with the other characters. Because, you, you know, the TV shows and the movies, you have Batman and Superman and you have Wonder Woman a little bit and Supergirl now has her own show and Flash and Green Arrow. And so you've got these, these sort of a little bit more familiar names, but there's also some really sort of off the wall characters, Nate Gray, Dr. Manhattan, Scarlet Witch or Black Bolt. These, some of these like super, super powered superheroes that people don't know that much about. And these friends of mine know about them and can say, oh yeah, there was this, this episode in this sort of series on on this particular character. And I, I think this is what you're looking for. So just having those resources, those human resources that I can go to has been really, really helpful. Robin Hansen from episode 73 on the age of M and how brain emulations will double economic growth every month. And what one theory in economics or a few theories in economics that at the time when you wrote that paper, what stood out to you? Because I know you made reference to a Malthusian catastrophe in your book. Well, uh, definitely even in ni- back in 1994, that one of the obvious implications that's been robust since then is the idea that uh, wages fall to subsistence levels. And again, that's not a strange, cat- you know, unusual scenario. You can call it a catastrophe, but it's the standard way most humans have ever lived. <laughs> and it's the standard way pretty much all animals have ever lived. It's the usual case. And we're going to go back to the usual case. And calling it a catastrophe is just putting your head in the sand, I think, about <laughs> refusing to uh, acknowledge that it can be the sort of, uh, it, it sort of thing that happens. Because if I could retire at the age of, say, 22, if I owned some M's, I'd be quite a happy person, even if I'm living on a, a margin, but still enjoying my life. 
Would you be well, the same as well yourself? Or well, again, again in, in this world, humans own most everything, at least initially. And so, if the world grows rapidly in wealth, they're the ones who are getting that wealth, so they can rapidly get more and more comfortable in their retirement. So, for the humans who have a, an average level of wealth, uh, their life is very good, at least as as long as they don't want to run things and be in the center of activity. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, this is true for ordinary people when they retire you know when you retire you don't have to work anymore and you can uh, you know sleep in late and you can socialize a lot but what you might miss which many retired people do miss is not being in the center of action not being controlled the, the, the not being the one who decides and determines what happens and so humans will have to accept that fate they can live comfortably in leisure and enjoy themselves and socialize but they can't be where the action is and they aren't deciding the big decisions and they aren't making the big things happen they are on the margins watching if you were living in the age of m right now i might not be talking to you i might be talking to a brain emulation of you but what would you be doing right now and what would your brain emulations be doing for you would it be cranking out academic papers one every 30 seconds and so uh, the typical speed that i estimate for emulations in this world is roughly 1000 times human speed so they are typically running much faster than we do. And so from their point of view, their world is more stable than ours. So our world uh, doubles many times in a lifetime, in our useful work lifetime. So if we if we have a you know 60-year work lifetime, then the world economy doubles four times in 60 years, which is a lot. Uh, for emulations, the world economy will double roughly once in their life, in their work lifetime. And so it's a stable world, even though it's a faster world objectively and certainly fast relative to to humans, it's slow, slower relative to them. Uh, so the typical emulation is doing whatever the jobs are that need doing. So in a subsistence level economy, they are doing mostly the jobs that support subsistence. So they are making computers, they are repairing them, they are building structures to hold them, they are putting energy support supplies into them, they are pulling things out and cooling, they are managing communica- communication networks, they are doing, of course, innovation to produ- improve all these things, uh, defense against attack for all these things, you know, the straightforward things. Just like a thousand years ago, a subsistence farmer's life was relatively straightforward and easy to predict. (laughs) What were subsistence farmers doing? Well, they were making the things they needed to survive. Food, clothing, shelter, heat, you know. uh, The sort of things they needed to survive was pretty much most of what they did. And uh, you can say the same about an emulation economy. Most of what they're doing are the things they need to survive, which are relatively easy to predict. So if I were a successful M worker in this world, I would have to be doing one of those things. I would have to find myself a niche where I was useful at doing one of the standard things that needed doing that could be writing software it could be um you know doing pipe maintenance uh could be all sorts of things now there would still be a few specialized artists or academics or things like that there always have been a few people like that they just were a smaller percentage of the world thousands of years ago and they'll probably be a smaller stay a smaller percentage in the future is it possible for a brain emulation to evolve from say dna sample or would it have to be a scan of a brain So there's two kinds of answers to give. So uh, one important thing is to say is I'm not talking about the entire future. So in the entire future, a great many things will eventually happen. I'm talking about the next era after ours, and this next era may only last two years in objective clock time, after which something else will happen. And I don't know what the next thing will happen. I I, I could ask me to speculate, but uh, basically I focused on this next era. And saying what happens then. And so during this next era, it's sort of its beginning is at least is defined by when you can at least first make an emulation. And when you can first make it, it's when you make it in the easiest possible way. Later on, it may be able to possible to make them in all sorts of other ways, but probably by then other stuff's going on and all the world's changed in other ways. So, you know, will we eventually colonize the galaxy? Sure, but not in the M era. (laughs) You know, will we make fusion energy? Maybe, but maybe not in the M era. So there's all sorts of things that will likely happen eventually in the future that don't necessarily happen during this m era this is just you know by definition in a sense it's around the scenario that the next really big thing that happens that really dramatically changes the growth rate of the economy is the arrival of brain brain emulations and then for a while that drives most change and then eventually something else drives change and i don't know what that is and eventually all the other things we've ever heard about will happen too Uh, genetic engineering space travel you know fusion energy, whatever it is you imagine, probably eventually it's going to happen, but not necessarily in the next era. And it's because the age of brain emulation will catapult us through that two-year period 
where we make so many advancements, whether it's to do with scientific right. discoveries, to do with health, the economy, etc. We just they'll just catapult us through such high speed that we will be, end up in a, a fifth age of right. space travel so or something. If, if the world economy doubles every month, then in a year it grows by a factor of a thousand, and in two years it's a factor of a million. Mm-hmm. So. At the end of this period, you should imagine a world economy that's vastly larger than ours. Yeah, It's vastly more powerful. It, it can do a lot more. Whatever it wants to do, it's the 800,000-pound gorilla that can do what it wants. But what it wants to do is survive, and so it's very driven to perpetuate itself in the subsistence economy. So most of its energies will be devoted to those basic subsistence inputs. So you wouldn't want to blink. Emily Scarbeck, episode 100 on the economics of natural disasters and the Samaritan's Dilemma. It's very much becoming a, a, va- a family show already. <laughs> yeah, I've already talked to Dave, but I was going to go into a little bit of a conversation there in terms of how your interests meet. But, you know, I'd love for people if they're interested in the economics of prison gangs, you know, just check out episode 55. Emily, I also love to be able to talk to you about one of your other papers where you mentioned the Samaritan's Dilemma. I know I'm kind of going back a little bit on your natural disasters, but it's something that I haven't come across before, the the Samaritan's Dilemma. Could you explain what that is? And is it something to do more with economics or is it more behavioral in terms of psychology? Or Well, it's, it is all about economics. Um, it's about incentives, really. And it's about in, institutions and incentives. So The idea of the Samaritan's Dilemma is this idea that in many situations, we are compelled to, we're in a strategic interaction with another person, and we can formalize it in game theory, but the idea is that we may have incentives to try to aid or try to help other people, but in doing so, those efforts can simultaneously undermine that person's own incentives to engage in productive activities. And so there's many different ways in which this type of dilemma can manifest, but it manifests often in, you know, the, the discussions on aid and foreign aid in general about this idea that when we, you know, when we give aid, we don't want to, we want to try to avoid undermining the recipient's incentives to engage in productive activities uh, simultaneously. So that's the dilemma. And how does that fit in in terms of the rest of the context of your paper? It says strategic courage and constitutional entrepreneurship. Yeah. So the, the dilemma is pervasive. The question is how, how do people overcome this dilemma? And they can they at all? Because, you know, in many cases, it's really pernicious. The, the term was coined by James Buchanan, and he was talking about kind of how it is that this dilemma can really undermine the ability of, of, of people to engage in productive activities. And he also can coin the term strategic courage. And the idea is that you have, it's a time and consistency problem on the part of the donor or the Samaritan in that your, your early self, to use the Kahneman language, you know, your, your system Two self would like to discipline your system one self, or your your earlier self would like to discipline your later self. But in order to do that, you have to self impose some kind of constraint. So you have to constrain yourself because it's your own preference, right down the line, to help someone. So the idea of it behind the paper is to look at how it is again in the context I was using uh, the Chicago fire how it is that this private group of businessmen were able to solve what's otherwise such a pernicious um, dilemma for states. States don't do a very good job of solving it, but this private association did. And so what I did is I looked at their constitutional structure and tried to establish how it is that they solved the three main problems that are associated with the Samaritan's Dilemma. The first of those is that in order to resolve the tension, the donors themselves have to actually recognize that there is this dilemma. They have to recognize that by aiding certain populations, they may 
you know, at the same time undermine their, their own incentives to engage in productive activity, which you'd be surprised in much of the aid literature how non-explicit <laughs> that is. There's an outright rejection in many cases that this is even a dilemma whatsoever. So the first is that they have to recognize it's a dilemma. The second is that they have to choose rules that are going to try to maximize the utility of both parties or, you know, broadly speaking, over the entire um, range of the dilemma. And then the third is that they have, and this is the crucial one, this is what separates uh, private associations from governmental associations as, as their ability to self-constrain, is they need a mechanism for delegating power of actually enforcing the rules that they choose. So the, the, the problem with the Samaritan's dilemma is that there's always an incentive to cheat. So unless you have a third party or some other mechanism for making sure that you hold yourself accountable, you're making sure that you engage in this strategic courage, then the entire project is going to unravel and you're, you're going to be back in the, the same situation that you are. So what's interesting about these private associations is there's, there's really great work that's been done. You have Pete Leeson on the program talking about pirates and pirate constitutions. Some of this follows off of that in, in that there's strong reasons to suggest that private groups of individuals, because they have residual claimancy right, on the actions of their own organization, uh, they operate in a competitive environment, and they permit themselves to sort according to their governance needs. So the pirates self-select uh, in their pirate communities. These organizations, in terms of providing these types of aid, operate in a similar competitive environment and self-select to establish their rules. And so it's these factors that tend to make private constitutions better suited to overcoming these problems of the Samaritan's dilemma rather than large-scale state organizations. Episode 73 with Peter Leeson on the invisible hook and the hidden economics of pirates. So there was an economic incentive to pirates. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. I mean, even apart from the from the kind of unemployment problem that the end of wars in the period would generate, there was a tremendous economic incentive. I mean, a, a successful pirate could earn in a single successful taking of a, of a prize 10, 20, 30 times as much as a, a comparable legitimate merchant seaman would make in a year. So, I mean, there were enormous financial rewards, but there were, of course, also corresponding risks. And is it true that they buried their treasure? Because it doesn't necessarily make sense unless they have to hide it uh, in order to come back at another time. Yeah, you know, I didn't really find much. So I didn't find much about that in the history of what I read other than the than, than folklore stories. I don't, I highly doubt, it certainly was not a regular practice. So let me say that. I highly doubt that large sums were were buried. It wouldn't really make a whole lot of sense to. I mean, pirates didn't didn't live very long. And they had this kind of um, little outlaw community sort of that set up shop complete with, you know, sort of gray market guys like, you know, um, workers in brothels and taverns and so on who had set up shop at their land bases. And, and I think pirates mostly, you know, blew their money there um, or died before they had to ch a chance to spend most of it. The whole idea of having a flag to Jolly Roger, because I know based on some information that you have since you were 17, a tattoo on your arm. Mm -hmm. And for a 17-year-old to have, whatever about having a pirate tattoo, but having it <laughs> resemble a supply and demand curve with the Jolly Roger, the crossbones, that's, some, yeah. that's something else. <laughs> no skulls on the tattoo, but I guess I could easily modify it. But there are crossbones, are there? No, there's just it's just supply and demand. So it looks kind of like crossbones because of the crossing curves, the intersecting curves. Um, but it's just a just a straight economics graph. But it looks like you know the, the the intersection looks like the crossed bones that, as you mentioned, graced many a pirate flag um, with their with their Jolly Roger. And is there a significance to this flag? I know everything like a flag is a sign has a signaling effect. Yeah, so I argue that um, that the the pirate, you know, it, it, there's kind of a puzzle here. A lot of things, a lot of behaviors that pirates engaged in present puzzles because on the surface they don't seem to make a whole hell of a lot of sense. You know, it seems like superficially at least, if you are engaged in criminal activity, 
And you know the authorities are out to get you, and the authorities were after after pirates in the early 18th century. The last thing you would want to do would be to, you know, create a special flag that indicates your criminal status and, and proudly display it as you sail around. <laughs> so it seems kind of odd. And so I argue that for, in the first place, pirates didn't just sail around with the with the Jolly Roger up. They used it at a particular moment in time um, because when they were engaging prey. Because it helped them to, as you mentioned, operate, it helped them to signal the fact that they were pirates as opposed to these other sorts of, um, of I don't want to call them warships. They were, they were basically warships. I'll call them warships. Other sorts of, of ships that were on the sea that had guys with guns who were out stopping merchant ships, who were in fact legitimate. A lot of them were, were Coast Guard vessels. So this is the era of mercantilism, and um, you know various countries would employ... Pirate-like crews, although they, they technically had these papers from their government saying they were p- permitted to do so, to sail around in waters where smugglers would come uh, come through to stop them and to interrogate them and to seize any any cargo that might be being smuggled illegally. So really the only thing that separated pirates from these guys was the fact that these guys had an official letter from their government saying that it was legal activity. The difficulty, the thing was that these Coast Guard vessels in particular, because they were legitimate vessels, were constrained in their ability to uh, attack a, a ship that they were coming up to. So, you know, if you're a merchant ship on the water and you see a ship approaching you that looks sort of ominous, on the one hand, it could be a Coast Guard vessel, which means that you might want to try and flee and run because ultimately, if you get caught by the Coast Guard vessel, they can rough you up, but they can't sort of murder everyone in your, in your ship, for example, in cold blood. The, the law didn't allow that. But if it was a pirate attacker, you know, the pirates were obviously not constrained by the law. They were outlaws already, and so they could, and in fact did, slaughter crews that uh, entirely that resisted them. So it was important for pirates to be able to communicate that they had this stronger punishment power if you tried to resist them compared to the Coast Guards. And a merchant ship just looking at potential attackers couldn't tell in the absence of a particular flag whether or not a ship was a Coast Guard vessel and thus legitimate, which they might want to try and run from, or if it was a pirate ship, which they would want to comply with unless they wanted to all die. Uh, and so I argue that pirates developed this flag as a way of communicating their, their piratical status uh, in order to solve that problem. And would pirates have a designated area and some kind of gentleman's agreement with one another in terms of the groups? Or a kind of occlusive agreement between pirates that they should not, you know, they might wave their flag at each other and say, okay, or would they particularly battle or break that occlusive agreement? I, you mean between ships, between pirate oh, ships? Yes, yes. Yeah. Um, no, they ha- yes, they, so pi- the pirate community was not large at all. And most pirates knew each other and in fact interacted frequently, not only through switching crews, um, but in fact, also at their land base in, in the Bahamas, they would interact with each other. So they knew each other, and obviously it didn't behoove them if they came across one another in the water to, to open fire on each other. But they did confront this issue that you mentioned of, of needing to communicate that they were a pirate ship. And so, yes, they used the flags for that purpose, and there are very few instances of pirates engaging one another in a battle-like scenario. And, and the cases that do exist seem to have been accidental. You know, they basically stopped fighting once they realized that they were, you know, they were brothers in piracy. Chris Coyne, episode 101 on the opportunity cost of war, exporting democracy and the Nirvana fallacy. And I'd love to know if you could talk us through how this epistemic reasoning actually takes place or unfolds when you marry the works of Mises and Hayek and uh, of Tullock and Buchanan. Sure. So it, it matters in a variety of ways, and I'll, I'll try to, to briefly touch upon a few of them. Uh, and so, as I mentioned, initially, I, I got excited about this and, and, and started studying it when, when the U.S. was focused on, on nation building in Af- Afghanistan and Iraq. And of course, the, these two uh, episodes were by no means the first time the United States uh, government had tried to do this or other governments for that matter. Uh, but it, again, it was the ones that were kind of unfolding, un- unfolding right in front of me. Uh, and, and the epistemic problem here is uh, do outsiders, so do interveners. Uh, know how to create uh, a free society. The the claims that were being made by the uh, U.S. politicians, by basically all those that supported the occupations and reconstructions of Afghanistan and Iraq, was that uh, the U.S. government could displace uh, the existing political regimes, the, the existing governments, and then rebuild uh, governments uh, and the supporting institutions, so political, legal, 
economic and social institutions to support uh, democratic or, or liberal democratic uh, societies uh, that, that would sustain absent U.S. presence. Uh, and so uh, you start thinking to yourself, OK, well, what does it take to rebuild a society and to design institutions? Uh, and so you can see how this quickly also uh, kind of marries with institutional economics uh, and with development economics as well, because all of these issues kind of tie together. And so, uh, I, you know, the first issue, of course, is figuring out what you want to do, what institutions you want. And of course, sitting in a, in a room, you know, in Washington, D.C. or wherever, uh, I imagine people could come up with a list, something analogous to like the Washington Consensus, where there's kind of general a list of propositions or characteristics of the institutions you want. You know, kind of the common high level catchphrases, rule of law, constrained government, uh, free markets and so on. Uh, and, and, and assuming you could come up with some kind of list, then the, then the issue is, of course, implementing that list. And here's where things get very difficult, because, of course, what you have is uh, typically Westerners uh, going in uh, with their own experiences, their own worldview, and trying to impose these institutions on another society. And, of course, the people living in that society have an array of historical experiences, belief systems, uh, culture, cultures. Uh, and so on, that oftentimes are not conducive to the institutions that are being uh, designed and implemented by outsiders. That then, of course, leads to a, a, a kind of catch-22 or dilemma, which is, uh, do you force these institutions uh, on people, uh, and or do you kind of back off? I say that's a dilemma because if your goal is to establish liberal democratic institutions, uh, forcing them on people, on people at gunpoint uh, there, there's an irony there. There's a tension, uh, which is those institutions are, are grounded in, in voluntary compliance, uh, in, in voluntary acceptance, uh, private property rights, and so on. And so uh, you can see how, how quickly this can get very murky and difficult. And, and also you can see why uh, it, 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 it oftentimes leads to outright failure and, and dysfunction. I know the question is always there. Why would they want to export democracy? Because, in a, say, countries who do not have a democratic society and maybe under a dictatorship rule could be seen as more of a stable state on the outside i don't know what what it's like on the inside whether there's tensions and you know like the way we had the arab spring rising whether that was the the result of some I don't know, some countries like the US or the UK trying to export democracy within regions and trying to create that tension to spill over and topple the governments there. But the question is, why would you want to export democracy? Is it more a political directive in terms of trying to, as you said, spread this liberal type of democratic thinking? Or is it more to do with economics and, say, the demands for a finite resource like oil and so on. I don't know. Did you explore that issue in After War? Well, in, in that book, how I begin that book is taking the stated ends of the U.S. government as given. So I've always tried very hard to the best of my ability to remain positive, uh, not in terms of optimistic, but but in terms of positive scientifically. So So not to inject any normative type of considerations into these issues. And so the way I start that book is I provide a bunch of quotes from George W. Bush and then previous U.S. presidents who are basically saying, look, the U.S. government wants to make the world safe for democracy. They want to spread democracy and so on. And then I, I focus on, is the U.S. government equipped to do that, to accomplish that end? That is, do they possess the means to achieve those ends? Uh, and of, of course, I, I, I'm fully cognizant, I'm, I'm fully aware of the fact that politicians may not be speaking honestly when they say they want to do this, that there might be ulterior motives, both in the present and throughout history. But um, I have no special insight into those. So I put those aside. That said, you know, I do think I understand what the argument is for spreading democracy. The argument, uh, the way I understand it is twofold, and it, and it links up two of the issues you raised. Uh, one is that in principle, if you can design and export a constitutionally constrained government, it will increase the rights of individuals, especially compared to the kind of regimes you were mentioning, kind of authoritarian regimes, which historically have trampled on people's rights if they ever had them whatsoever. The second, of course, then is the, the other point you raise, which is an economic one, which is that uh, the argument goes that if democracy or liberal democracy and all that goes along with it, including relatively free market spread, then that leads to integration, 
uh, kind of the, the capitalist peace hypothesis, whereby trading partners are less likely to engage in conflict and so on. And of course, in, in the U.S. context, this is widely embedded uh, in the post-World War II context, which was the Cold War. And so, you know, the alternative to spreading democracy was was viewed at the time by many as the spread of communism. And so the argument was, well, look, uh, if those are our two choices, we're going to try to spread democracy to our to the greatest ability that possible, uh, and and take active steps to do that, whether it's directly or indirectly through through proxy proxy wars and, and client states. Part of the issue, I think, with this uh, at its core is it neglects a lot of the insights from uh, Buchanan and Tulloch. Uh, that is, it assumes that kind of all political actors are are, are benevolent um, and that they. Uh, can do what you want them to do, or they can do what they want to do, and there's no government failure. Uh, there are no perverse incentives at play. Uh, there are no bureaucratic issues, and so on. And so, another aspect of the work I've tried of my work that I've tried to point out is that uh, you can't just uh, look. You can't ima- simply imagine a better state of the world and then implement policy based on that. And what I mean by that is, if you look around the world at any point in time, there are many terrible governments. There are many terrible humanitarian crises, and we can imagine a better state of the world. So we can imagine a state of the world where, you know, the Assad regime is not in charge in Syria. We can imagine a state of the world where Gaddafi is in charge of Libya and so on. Now, the question is, do you actually take steps to do that? Uh, And and one of the things that continues to amaze me is that many people in public policy, uh, when it comes to international relations, Refuse to ask the, the point that was raised, of course, by Bastiat and then by Hazlitt, which is kind of the, the seen and the unseen, or, or to put it another way, the way Thomas Sowell puts it is to always ask, and then what? So you, you intervene, and then what happens? And then what happens? So those are trying to trace out the unseen or, or unintended consequences that emerge. And so the reason I, I, I emphasize this point is, is, is to highlight that oftentimes we can think of things that, that would be preferable, at least in an idealized sense, but that doesn't mean we can bring them about. And oftentimes these interventions can bring about even worse harms that we couldn't anticipate. Uh, and sometimes you can anticipate them. Again, to, 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 to provide Libya as an example, uh, you know, Gaddafi, terrible authoritarian despot doing bad things to his people. So, so the argument goes, well, okay, the U.S. government and other Western governments need to enforce a no-fly zone in order to assist in his downfall. Uh, and, and that happens. And of course, at the time, those in the U.S. government were patting themselves on the back because uh, this was supposed to be the, the new foreign intervention. It was no boots on the ground, no military occupation, uh, no, no U.S. lives at risk, and so on. Uh, of course, the, 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 the big question that everyone seemed to forget was, well, what's going to happen the day after Gaddafi goes away as the leader of the country? Uh, it's not like a, a well-constructed constitutional democracy is going to magically appear. Uh, instead, what you've gotten is is both a, a civil war internally uh, and regional instability as well, as that conflict has spilled over to Mali uh, and other surrounding areas. And so uh, you can you can see how neglecting these basic principles about knowledge, incentives, the seen and the unseen can can really lead to devastating consequences. And, and on the flip side of that. How thinking through how those issues apply uh, by no means provide all the answers, but can help us sharpen our thinking about the limits of our ability to improve the world around us. Episode 112 with Stuti Kamani, making politics work for development and using creativity and the arts to make better policy decisions. Why do you think citizen engagement and transparency then holds the key to solving, say, government failures, even though that example of government there was failure there, but he wanted to make some incremental changes to policy. But if there's evidence of governments failing because the old policies are still in place or and the actors who are part of that particular market do not tend to respond to new policies or end up not wanting to, I suppose, cooperate with government, what can the citizen do or how, how important, like, do they hold the key for disengagement and transparency? Yeah, so I think that's an excellent question, Frank. And I think we, again, we confronted this very early on in the report by making a real distinction between what we call apolitical citizen engagement and political engagement. So, in fact, we described it in a very similar way to how you did just now. 
where, you know, if the problem is in the incentives and behavior of powerful political actors and vested interests, I mean, what can citizens do even with transparency? Uh, you know, so, quote unquote, ordinary citizens who bear no office, who have no powers within the government. And we described how the one type of power that citizens are increasingly acquiring around the world is the power to select and sanction leaders. So elect, you know, so we provide data on how electoral institutions are spreading ac uh, across countries, even if individual countries might have sort of stagnated or moved in a different direction than elect uh, than competitive elections. Overall, the distribution of countries around the world in every region has shifted towards a greater role for ordinary citizens in selecting and sanctioning their leaders, typically through electoral processes. And it's not just at the national level, even within countries where national political institutions are not so electoral in the in the common sense. Um, uh, even these countries uh, have local electoral and political competition at the local government level. And uh, so in a world where uh, either formal institutions are changing or even informally citizens are taking to the streets or using mass media to coordinate uh, massive collective action, uh, they are either being given by the system or are acquiring by force uh, these powers of selecting and sanctioning leaders. And that is how we analyzed it in the report. Uh, and that is how we we pulled out this single thread from quite a complex web of uh, political economy research, that it's the selection and sanctioning of leaders that is funding both government failure and how to solve it. And given that we are in this global context of increasing citizen engagement and increasing transparency, how can we use these global forces to improve the selection and sanctioning of leaders so that it happens more on the basis of performance and delivering broad public goods. What you describe, and I never came across this term before, but you describe how new information and communication technologies has put, in a way, some power back into the hands of citizens of a particular country. And you describe that as a dictator's dilemma. <laughs> Sadly, it's not my invention. Uh, I borrowed it directly from the World Development Report 2016 on the Internet and, and digital technology. And I believe they have a text box on the dictator's dilemma. And I believe they have used it from other authors in their turn. <laughs> uh, so it's worth looking at that, that box in the WDR 2016. Uh, and then, of course, we, we say what it is uh, in the report as well. And it is really this dilemma that the dynamic media markets, techno new technologies of information and communication are making it. We live in a world where uh, power has become more dispersed uh, and leaders have to deal with that. And it's in their enlightened self-interest to try to harness these forces uh, for the public good. Uh, and that can be done in very diverse institutional ways. Uh, and so we provide one very abstract lens of looking at how any particular institution uh, is, is likely to function well or not. And that abstract lens uh, is whether leaders will be selected and sanctioned on the right basis, whether contestation for leadership will happen on the right, pla right platforms of public goods. And the concept of, a, of the dictator's dilemma, correct me if I'm wrong, but when there was evidence of the Arab Springs and other kind of conflict that might be going on internally, civil wars and that type of thing, before all of these events actually occurred, we possibly knew that there were dictators in some countries. But when the Arab Springs broke out and then we see if, um, some videos and stories from Aleppo, it's quite obviously heartbreaking, but the media has allowed us to get in touch and get a some small sense of what people are suffering and why they want, in other cases, why they want an end to dictator rule. Mm. Well, you know, let me try to push back on this a little, because I think we could think of the opposite examples where more authoritarian developmental leaders who actually make the state perform much better in servicing their citizens than many messy democracies. Yes. And let me also 
point out a real problem with messy democracies, which is that it's not really nefarious leaders, but it's prejudices, biases, myopia, and the lack of capacity to understand technical evidence among citizens at large, which can prevent well-intentioned leaders from doing what is supported by, by the evidence. Governments in every institutional context can fail to deliver the public goods that are needed, again, for competitive markets, for tackling persistent inequality and poverty. You know, when leaders are able to gain office and gain power in government by polarizing citizens and exploiting these ideological divisions among them rather than seeking common ground. Uh, and I think this type of problem not only applies across institutional contexts, not, not only can it turn our priors about democracy versus, versus dictatorship on its head, but in fact, it applies across rich and poor countries. So I think some of the lessons from this sort of applying economic tools to understand political markets applies equally to rich countries as to poor countries. And, you know, in a sense, I, I wonder if we can be truly revolutionary with this report uh, and say that the, the business of development is not necessarily one of taking lessons from the rich world and building capacity in the poor world that when it comes to governance, it may in fact be the other way around, that the, the hunger of citizens in the poor world to do something about the problem of uh, politics, uh, the, the urgency of the problem, the lack of delusion uh, that uh, you know things are not all going great, that we need to do better, may be allowing poor countries to experiment more with institutions of public accountability. Uh, while citizens in the rich world may be more complacent, sort of more smug in their superiority. Um, and so I wonder whether uh, uh, these governance questions uh, and the role of transparency and citizen engagement, whether there's uh, a lot we can learn from the evolving experience of poor countries and apply it elsewhere. If you enjoyed this podcast, why not leave some feedback or comments on the show notes page on economicrockstar.com, where you can also sign up and be a member of the Economic Rockstar community. If you're listening to this episode on iTunes or Stitcher Radio, I would love to have some feedback and for you to leave an honest rating and review, as this will help with the rankings of the show so that more people can find it. If you're listening on the website economicrockstar.com, make sure you check out the back catalogue of all previous episodes and interviews with some amazing professors and authors at economicrockstar.com forward slash podcasts. Thanks for listening and I really appreciate your loyal support. I know how much you love audio, so why not get a free audiobook with Economic Rockstar today? I've teamed up with audiobooks.com to bring you this amazing offer. Visit audiobooks.com forward slash rockstar to download your free audiobook now.